mentioning. Um, Uncle David, if you would go on ahead and open it up with a prayer, and then okay. we'll get into the discussion part and the listening. Okay. So, so I'm going to go ahead and do a prayer. I'm going to, I could pray in a number of different languages, but I'm going to pray in English, okay, so that we understand it. So, <clears throat> um, Tinto and Nancy, grandfathers and grandmothers, I ask that you look down upon all of us, all of us, look down upon our community and and bless us in a good way, grandfathers and grandmothers. This is a, a difficult time for us, and we're struggling with this disease that's um, all around the world at this point. And we look um, for you to help us to be healthy, help us to make the right kinds of choices and do the right kinds of things, that you help us with the patience that we need to be able to just um, accept the way things are, and to not uh, fight against them, not struggle against them, and just do what we have to do to keep ourselves healthy. We look for blessings and good health and, and abundance of love and joy and happiness and, and all the resources we need for ourselves and for our community and for our loved ones, uh, for our families and friends. And, and so we re really ask you, grandfathers and grandmothers, to, to watch over us and take care of us. Uh, thank you for this time for us to be able to speak to one another and to look introspectively um, uh, at ourselves and at our community and to really grow in a whole different way because sometimes we're too busy just to take the time and sit and talk and, and ground ourselves. So thank you for this opportunity to ground ourselves and, and thank you for this opportunity for our Mother Earth to be able to heal from all the assaults that we have been um, you know, putting upon her for so long, for decades now. And so we, we pray for our Mother Earth, pray for her healing and well-being, pray for all the animals, all the trees and all the plants, and, and let this be a time of good healing for all of us, and let us put aside our bitterness and our, our, our unhappiness and, and just really, really find that, that health and healing that we need as a community, as a world, as a people. Oh, Thank you. Uh, I can see everybody's smiling, um, eyes wide open, and really thankful to hear your words and to to feel that blessing, not just only upon us, but upon Nigotsan, upon Grandmother Earth. So, so thank you, everyone, again, for joining us. Um, going to open it up. Uncle David, where do you want to begin the, the journey? Uh, uh, please share with us. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to uh, share my screen here so that um, if you bear with me for a moment as I get everything up and going. Um, so, aquí um, uh, who am I? And, and, and so I'm going to talk about um, our Apache community here and, and, and here in Apacheria, here in Indeta. And, and as I talk about our community, I'm going to do it from the perspective of, you know, the, the best way to tell stories sometimes is telling our own personal story. So I'm going to tell my personal story and, and the relationship I have to us and, uh, as a community and, and embedded within this, this story is a larger narrative about our experience as Apache people. We, we have the intent of getting ourselves recognized um, with the state of Colorado. And, and the idea isn't in to, to impose upon uh, Apache people any way of being, but rather to get us recognized so that each and all the separate little bands will have their own way of doing things, but we'll have the, the, the formal recognition that we need to be able to uh, extend some of the benefits to us that we need. One of the most important uh, being for, at least uh, from our community's perspective, um, being able to go out and pray in the way that we need to pray. So oftentimes our ceremonies are disrupted and, and that's just not okay. And we don't always have um, the capacity to be able to respond legally um, because we're not always recognized. Now we've made a lot of noise in our community here in this area, um, in the Boulder Metro area and across Colorado, because many of our community members continue to hold the ceremonies anyway. But anyhow, so I, I'd like to be able to, to begin there so we have a context from, from where we're going here and, and talk a little bit about myself. So let me, let me begin first by talking about uh, who we are as a people. Oftentimes when people talk about, and especially there's a lot of trend in the academic community to talk about um, this land as being uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho land. And, and in, in that narrative, there's, and, 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 and you can understand that if, if we look at the idea that when uh, the white Americans came here from the East and invaded this area about uh, 170 years ago, 
when they came here, that's who they found here. And so when you walk into a room and you find a group of people in the room and then you kill them all and you take, the, you, you take uh, possession of the room, uh, whatever stories you heard walking into the room are the only stories you're going to have. What you don't have is a history of that room and that's what happened here. And, and so there, there are people that, that, that continue, people that survived um, the Holocaust, the uh, Armageddon that has been visited upon us. But, but what we need to recognize is that um, the people that are telling the story so often um, is the white community. It's a white and American community. And for reasons that benefit them, they totally ignore any history that doesn't fit into the narrative that they want to tell. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling up a couple of maps here to give you an idea that predates their arrival. So this is a map of 1710, John Senex map. And um, while, while the, the, if you look at the map, it, it isn't absolutely correct. It's, 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 it's distorted in some kind of ways. But as you, but what we well know at the, at, you know, 300 years ago when they're drawing maps, they, they, all they know is what they've walked or what they've heard about or what they've seen or what they've been told. So it's not wholly accurate, but what is accurate about it is any map, when people write maps, and these were always men that they're drawing these maps, when they write the maps, the map is informed by the politics of the day. And that's important to remember. So there are two things that are real important for me to point out on this particular map. It's circled in red here. And this area that's circled in red is the area, one of the, the primary areas that's first colonized by the people coming up from Mexico City. Now, I know the people of New Mexico would like to believe that they are Spanish, and they argue that. And there's a whole reason for that, and I'll get into that a little later. But um, they, they keep saying we were occupied, with the, that this place was um, colonized by the Spaniards. The fact of the matter is the country Spain did not exist at that time. Uh, there was no Spain. There was Castillo and the people of Castillo that came and colonized this area. But most of the people that actually colonized this area weren't even from uh, the Iberian Peninsula. They were from Mexico City. And the people that had colonized Mexico City were primarily Tlaxcalans. So we have a handful of people that are uh, descended from the Iberia Peninsula because recognize they've already been there uh, for a few generations before they come up here. Um, and they come up from Mexico City and they colonize this area. So it's mostly Tlaxcalan people. This is in the history books. You can debate it with me if you like, but I encourage you to do the history. So here's a map and here's what they find when they come north. There, there are, there's a territory that is already occupied and it's occupied by two primary peoples, right? The Nahua speaking people, and the Nahua speaking people are the people in the Pueblos, all in up and down the Pueblos, they mostly speak Nahua. That includes the Hopi, the Tiwas, the Tewas, the, po the Piro, they're, they're all these people. Plus you have some of the Yaquis that arrived a little bit later. These are all Nahua speaking people. And then you go to the Comanche, the Shoshone, uh, the Utes, um, the Paiutes. These are all Nahua speaking people. So they've come into an area that had a name already, and that name was Tewayo. So you can see that written on here, Great Tewayo. It's the northern outpost of the larger Nahua community that extends all the way down into Costa Rica. Okay, So that's one name. The other name for the area is Apacheria or Indeta. And you'll see it. So you, when you look on the map, you'll actually see Apacheria and you see all the different uh, Apache peoples that they have listed on here. So let me take you to another map. It's a little more recent. This one's... Um, about 100 years later, this is a map in the 1800s, uh, 1803. And you see the same area. Now they have the area that they've colonized as Nuevo Mexico, if you look upon the map, and it's the area that is um, in blue and red. It's outlined in, it has a line of blue and red. And that's primarily the area that has been colonized by the people coming up from Mexico City. But all the way around it, and particularly in the north, are all these different uh, Apache groups that they're naming, including the Caralanas, the, 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 uh, uh, the Jicarillas, the, I mean, they, they're the, the, the Gilas. There are all these different groups there. So what's real clear about this is that we're talking about Apache territory. Um, now, let me take a moment to, to talk about that. From Montana all the way down into to New Mexico, along the eastern uh, side of the mountains, what we call the Front Range in Colorado, there were villages. And there were villages that were all walking distance from each other. So right here in Boulder, Colorado, where I live, 
there was a village. There were a couple of villages here, actually. One right up against the mountains and one out um, a few miles out uh, into an area that's called uh, White Cliffs, I think it's called. And these were Apache villages. You go up north a little bit, and there were a couple of villages in Lyons. You walk south a little bit, there, were, there was a village there in an area um, around Golden. You walk further south, there were villages there in Colorado Springs. And so there were villages all the way up and down this front range, down into New Mexico, all the way up, up to Montana. Um, we had our, the Apache people extended all the way out into Bear Butte in that area. Uh, we were up in Montana in that area. The Athabascan people extended all the way up into Alaska. These are all related linguistically. But this front range was settled. It was settled. These were not nomadic people. Our people were settled people. We had our villages. Um, the anthropologists will tell this differently because it fits their narrative. But what happens is our settled villages were disrupted. They were disrupted by the fact that the people that came up from the south, the colonizers that came up from, uh, uh, from Mexico City, brought with them three things, guns, diseases. Uh, they're seeking gold, so they're greedy, but they also brought diseases with them. So these are the things that they bring up, um, and they brought the horses. So as they bring up the guns and the horses, these are now something that are of interest uh, to people in the area. So what happens is what they implemented and instituted was a slave trade. Now they inst instituted this slave trade long before they got here into this area colonizing. Um, as soon as they washed ashore in, in Veracruz and started traveling in, they were taking up slaves right and left. And one of the first slaves that you hear about all the time is Malinche. Uh, Malinale was her name. She had been enslaved. Um, she was part of a prominent family. She was, the, she, she was contested um, the right of her brother to, to rule. So what they did is they, they pulled her out and sold her to some Mayan people. So she became fluent in Mayan. She spoke Mayan and Nahuatl. And then when she arrived, there was a person, uh, this, the Spaniards didn't arrive with, with Cortez. They had, they had actually arrived a couple of times before, some of whom had been killed along the Yucatan and in, into Tabasco and that area. And so there was one man that had stayed, a couple of people that had stayed, one that wanted to stay and, and become Mayan, and another one that, that was a slave and he wanted out. And so the Spaniards found him and they used him because he was fluent in Mayan. And so he translated uh, from Mayan to Spanish and um, Malinali translated from Nahuatl to Mayan, and that's the way Cortez was able to communicate when he got here. But through the whole process, they're taking slaves, and they never stopped taking slaves. Even though it had been outlawed in Spain, they continued to use um, three rules that they could follow. And one of the rules was that if some community is aggressive, if they, if they, they come at you aggressively, then you can make war on them and take slaves. So that's the rule that they would use that justified their ability to impose slavery um, on indigenous people in this area. And so what they did is they're looking for, for gold and silver. Now we think about the gold, the, the time frame in which they actually found and mined gold was very short. When they found gold, they extracted it uh, very quickly. But what they continued to mine over a protracted period of time, hundreds of years, was silver. So most of the enslavement of our people had to do with the mining of silver. And they found a really important mine in um, Zacatecas. But they needed people to work it. They needed slaves to work it. So what they do is they'd continuously move forward, move up, up the, 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 the territory here into um, uh, Turtle Island. They would make war on a community and claim that that community made war on them. And then they'd take the slaves they wanted. They'd take the women, the children, and the young men, and they'd send the young men to Zacatecas to work the mines. Um, and this is the way they, they, they progressed all the way up here. Um, you hear the stories of Cibola, and you hear the stories of them chasing gold up into the seven cities of Cibola in this area. Um, but what they're really doing is they're, they're coming for money. All, it, it, the, they were always motivated by money. Um, their, their colonization had to do with making themselves rich. So as they move forward, they make war on us. And as they make war on us and they take our, our young men and they take the children, um, they baptize them because they have to do that. That's part of their rules. And then um, they, they enslave them, teach them Spanish, teach, they, they, they make them Catholics. Um, and, they, and but they enslave them and they continuously send the men down to work in the mines. And so as they come up here, this is what they're imposing on us is this slave trade. 
So by the time they finally settled in the area that we now know today as New Mexico, what happens is they have a style of being and they don't find any gold up here. There aren't really mines. There's turquoise up here, but there aren't really mines. Um, so the only other thing of value to them is labor. And so uh, they, that's what they impose. And so what they're imposing is a slave trade. And this slave trade is really important and necessary to understand because it changed the dynamics of the whole area of all of Apacheria. It changed the dynamics of how people related to one another. One of the communities that uh, was able to really uh, opportunistically take advantage of the guns and the horses that are introduced in the late 1500s. By the early 1600s, um, horses and guns were spread throughout this area. But one of the communities that was able to do that was the Comanche. The Comanche was an aggressive branch of the Shoshone people. The Shoshone, uh, all of our communities, we didn't have jails, we didn't have prisons. So what we would do is we would just banish people from our communities. Well, the Comanche were a banished community. These were mostly young men that are banished from the Shoshone. They create their own community, but um, they, and they're aggressive. They can be as aggressive and as mean as and nasty as they want, and they were. Um, but they, once they got horses and once they got guns, um, they realized they could engage in the slave trade that was happening from the colonizers in the area of Nuevo Mexico and take the women and children, some of the women they kept as wives, but some of the women and children, they would take them and they'd sell them at the slave markets in New Mexico. And, um, and, and that way they could trade for more guns and more horses. And so they, they became a dominant uh, factor here on the Plains area. So they ended up pushing the Apache out of their villages. They knew where the villages were, so they didn't even have to go looking for us. They went straight to the villages, raided the villages, and so our people, as Apache people, became nomadic out of necessity because if we stayed in one place, we could expect that the Comanche would come and raid our, our, our communities and steal our children, steal our women, and that's exactly what happened. So all these communities up and down the Front Range were abandoned, and people left instead and became nomadic. Apache people became nomadic. We extended, as I said, from uh, the Dakotas, uh, Montana and the Dakotas all the way down into uh, New Mexico. And so what we ended up doing was continuously as Apache people continuously moving for, uh, further and further south. So we end up all the way down into areas into the Mapimini, Mapimini Desert, which is down by Monterrey. Um, um, and so, we, we have an, a great expanse of area that we live and reside in where we have had communities and where we've been, but we're trying to avoid the Comanche as we move further down. So then what happens is there's a war uh, that you know as the French Indian War in the East. I refer to it as the First uh, World War um, because in this First World War, they were actually fighting between the English speakers, the English speakers, which we recall, we, we refer to as the British, um, but again, there were monarchies, there's no countries at this time in the 1700s. Um, so we have the English speakers and the Franco speakers. There's no France at the time, but they're the Franco speakers and they're all fighting for territory. Um, the Franco speakers have claimed a lot of the area we now know as the United States. So most of the South, all the way up the Mississippi and up into Canada. And so they have this war that they call the French Indian War. These two communities are fighting. They're fighting in Europe, they're fighting in the Philippines, they're fighting in India, and they're fighting in, um, in, on Turtle Island, uh, which is the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And as they're fighting, uh, the English speakers end up winning. But they, what they start doing is pulling native peoples to, to be their soldiers in this war, in this first world war, in this area. And so there were some communities that were disrupted by that war, they're trying to get away from it, and they began slowly to migrate away from the Great Lakes area, and they come out into this area, eventually arriving in the early 1800s, and these are the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, um, and the, uh, uh, the Sioux peoples. And I say Sioux because it's Dakota, Lakota, Nakota. So the Sioux peoples come into this area. So they're not actually here in Colorado until the 1800s, the early 1800s is when they begin arriving. And then within 50 years, then the white, pe white people have come from um, 
the Americans have come from the east and colonize this area. And that's who they encounter is the people that they've been pushing west. They encounter them here. So this isn't Cheyenne and Arapaho and Sioux land. This is Apache land. Um, this is also Ute land. Um, that it was Nawa land and it was Inde land. And these people have all been displaced first by the colonizers coming up from the south and then the colonizers coming from the east. So this is who we are, but this has been forgotten. But as Apache people, we've been very um, adaptive. And so uh, what people don't recognize about us is, is what the people that came up from the south introduced uh, the Castellano, the Spanish language. And we had to learn that language and we're enslaved. Our children are being stolen and raised in these communities. Sometimes we escaped and went back to our communities, but now we're fluent in two languages. We speak Inde and we speak Spanish out of necessity. And so Spanish becomes the lingua franca that we're, the lingua franca that we're able to use with, to communicate to other people. So when Geronimo and some of the others had to deal with the Americans, they were speaking Spanish to them. They weren't speaking Apache. And that's how they communicated. And so what happens is we're, we're able to move through cultures back and forth. Um, and that's what we do. We, be, we become involved in the slave trade, either as the people that are being stolen and enslaved or the people that are also part of, because we need guns and horses, that are stealing children, other people, other communities, Indian children, and selling them at the markets um, in Mexico, in New Mexico. So because all of this is happening, um, then we are absolutely being displaced. We, this is our land, Colorado, um, all the way up to Wyoming, Montana. This is all Apacheria, all the way down into Mexico. But as different peoples are coming in as a, as a consequence of colonization from the south and then from the east, then we're being displaced and moved around, but we're adaptive. And so out of necessity, we're Apache people, but you know, if we need to, we can be New Mexicans. We can be vecinos. We can be genisaros. We can be, and we have been. And then in the later, in the 1960s, we become Chicanos. Um, because we're still resisting colonization, but we're also adapting to the changes. So we see a lot of people who are actually from Colorado, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Texas, these areas, and we're now calling ourselves Chicano. We're still brown people, we're indigenous people. Spanish has become the lingua franca that we're using to, to talk to one another uh, because we've lost in day as a consequence of, of, of slavery and, and being captured. But we're still, uh, we're, we still know who we are, and we're still living um, in accordance to some of our old codes in terms of how to relate to one another, the things to respect, the things that we have taboos around like bears and snakes and, and owls. Um, and we're still eating the same foods. Now we've adapted, and instead of, of corn tortillas, we're eating flour tortillas that the Spaniards brought up from them, the colonizers from Mexico City brought up with them with wheat. Um, but we're doing that, we're still eating beans, we're still eating chili, we're still eating a lot of our foods. And so we haven't changed. And if you go into the different communities, if you spend time with Apache people, if you spend time with Navajo Picho, people, with Navajo people who are also Apaches, if you spend time with people from the Pueblos and you spend time with Chicanos, you find that they, their, their mannerisms, their cultures, their ways of doing things are much the same. There may be minute differences, in belief systems or, or in prayer or in language. But for the most part, we're all still the same people. We want to divide ourselves because that's what uh, white America would like for us to do. Um, and we continue to divide ourselves, but there's no need for that because we're all the same people speaking two primary languages, Nahuatl. Although people in the Pueblo say, oh, we speak Tiwa, oh, we speak Tewa, but it's all Nahuatl. They're all derivatives of Nahuatl language. Um, and, uh, and then the other one was Inde. Um, and is the other language, the common language. So these are the languages um, that are common, and this is a little bit of history. And I, I wanted to put this in context because people, you won't find this history in history books. I had to do a lot of research, a lot of talking, and a lot of interviewing of people to find out that we are descendants of the slave trade. That many of our people, our, our, our ancestors, our grandparents, were part of the slave trade. We were, or they were stolen from their families. Um, they were uh, enslaved and they were released and later on they're called Genisaros. And then they set up their own communities throughout New Mexico and up into Colorado. So while a lot of the people in Southern Colorado and New Mexico wanna call themselves Spaniards, they're actually descendants of slaves 
and their descendants of the Apache people, the, their descendants of the Paiute, of the Ute, of the Comanche, the Shoshone, uh, a number of different indigenous communities because we're all stealing each other's children and all engaged in this slave trade. So let me talk a little bit about, um, about who I am. So here's another picture, uh, a little bit closer, um, the same area. And as you can see, once again, all the way around the northern areas um, are all these different Apache groups. I think I counted over 13 different Apache groups they have listed in here. Once again, just confirmation that we're in Apache territory. So, you know, um, we had a meeting a few years ago, our community, the Henicero Apache of, of this area, met with the people from New Mexico uh, who regard themselves as Genisaro, mostly from um, Abiquiu and um, uh, Rancho de Taos and some of those areas. They came up and we had a meeting and I thought we had a good robust conversation. Unfortunately, they think of us as a diaspora. Now, if you think about that word diaspora, diaspora are people that um, are outside of their own territory that have spread out. So if we think about um, the black people, the black communities in the United States, they are a diaspora because their original homeland was in Africa and they have since spread and you find uh, black people all around the world. The same is true for all communities. So the white people being here are a diaspora. They're not really from here, they're from Europe. But we are in our own territory. To call us a diaspora as if the, the, the place we came from was um, Abiquiu is just not true. We were stolen from our homelands all the way up here in Colorado, Wyoming, all these areas, taken to New Mexico, slow, sold in the slave trades, and then released, and then given uh, sometimes permission to uh, settle grants, uh, land grants, um, that extended up into Colorado. So to, to assume that that's where we came from is just erroneous, it's, it's just wrong. All of this is our homeland. We are Henisaro people, uh, a very contemporary term that we're using to refer to ourselves as indigenous people, but we have all, we're, we're on our homeland. We have always been on our homeland and it extends pretty much from Canada down to Costa Rica. So we're not a diaspora. And I just wanna make that, that clarification uh, for those people that are making that claim. Um, when you look at the contemporary maps today, this is what they're going to show you. And when they show the areas of Colorado, they show the Ute, uh, the Southern Cheyenne, and the Arapaho. This is a post-Treaty um, of Guadalupe Hidalgo map. Um, and so it shows the Sioux and the Black Hills, which was Apache territory. So it shows the Cheyenne in Wyoming and Colorado, which was Apache territory. It shows the Arapaho here, which is Apache territory. Um, and, and so what happens is this, this is a, a snapshot that is taken from the white colonizers from the East, um, the way they look at us when they got here, but what, not, what is not, not taken into account in this particular map is what had happened before. And so I like to remind people about that because when they think about us as Apache people and say, well, you're not from here, you're from Dulce. No, Dulce was a, an internment camp where some of our people were locked up, some of our people. The rest of us just adapted into the territory. When they came in and asked us, we said, oh, no, 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 we're from here. We're, 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 we're uh, vecinos, or later on, we're Spanish, and, and, or we're Mexican-American, and then eventually we're Chicano. And today we're recognized, you know what, we're Apache. We've always been Apache, and we've just used different terms um, that we've, uh, in ways in which we've categorized ourselves. But we've always been, we are on our homeland and have always been here. We haven't left. And, and we're not divided by territories. These ideas of state borders, and these ideas of national borders, they don't mean anything to us because we're still and always have been on our homeland. So let me switch a little bit and talk about um, our community. So this is my mother on the left and my grandmother on the right. Um, Apache people, um, this is my mother, my grandmother had one faucet coming into the house and this is in Lahana. This is in Lahana, Colorado, a very modern place, if you will, but she still has an outhouse. And this is when I'm growing up and this is back in the 70s, 80s. And um, this was an area where there was a very intact cultural community, uh, an indigenous community uh, that was plowed down uh, so the pickle factory could go in and take over that whole area. 
Um, and then they were given $5,000 for the homes and displaced. At that point, $5,000 wasn't enough to buy anything. So they all end up in, in low income housing. So an intact community disrupted this is part of the continuation of colonization and what I call gringismo and I, I'm okay with using that term. Now, when people ask me, well, you're Spanish, I've been to Spain. Now we do have Spanish ancestors that I could claim if I wanted to claim that. But I've been to Spain and I promise you, I'm not Spanish. There was, in fact, the whole time I was in Spain, I was very, very angry because these are the people that came and colonized us. You know, We're out there doing work with groups of communities there in Spain. And a couple of people actually apologized and they said, we're so sorry for what's happened to you. But the majority of them could care less. And the fact of the matter is all they wanted from us was money, was gold and silver. And that's what they took. Um, but uh, I have a great grandfather that came here during the Mexican-American War, so the mid 1800s, and his name was um, Jose um, Nieves Madrid. He came over and he came with his his, his children, and Nieves is, is one of his children. Um, so these people came over; uh, they they were fighting the war on the Mexican side, and then just stayed and stayed here and stayed in New Mexico. So they lived in New Mexico and Southern Colorado, but they end up marrying our Apache women, my Apache grandmothers. And so this is uh, one of them. Uh, another uh, picture of them, he's on the far left. And then on the far right is my grandfather and my grandmother and their first child, uh, Isabel, uh, which was my auntie. And so these are old pictures that are taken, some reference that we have of them. This is uh, my mother's side of the family. My mother's on the left there and my grandfather and my grandmother in the middle. Um, all of these people are gone except for an uncle. Uh, they've passed on to the spirit world. Um, on my dad's side, um, there's a longer story which I won't share here about my, my great grandmother here who's Apache. When you look at her, there's no question that this is an Apache woman. Um, and um, she was forced to marry my grandfather. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, she died very young. She died shortly after my grandmother was born. And then um, he ended up marrying her sister. Uh, he never got to marry the sister that he wanted, but um, this is the way it was. Uh, he just went back to the same family. Your daughter died, I need another one. And so that's the way things went. Um, so it, it was never a happy relationship. And that was shown with my grandmother who was also never really happy in her relationship. On my grandfather's side, on my dad's side, um, these are the people, again, the women in the family seem to be very unhappy. They were, they were mean-spirited. They were, these, these weren't necessarily pleasant women to be around. And part of it had to do with the fact that they were so oppressed by the men. And this is something that Catholicism and, and colonization brought that made women the property of men, that made children the property of men, which isn't fair. It's part of patriarchy. It's part of uh, Catholicism. Uh, but that's just the way it was. But our people came from, uh, from the Pueblos and from the Apaches. This is a picture of me um, and my grandmother's holding me, my uh, paternal grandmother. Uh, I, I seem to be a little stressed I think I knew what was coming in terms of uh, what life would be like. Um, so here we are, this is the town that I grew up in actually is Las Animas. Las Animas is on an Apache reservation. There was an area, a territory in Southern Colorado set aside for the Cheyenne and the Arapaho and then the Apache were, la were added to that. Um, the reservation after the Sand Creek Massacre, they just forgot about it. But this is the area that we were assigned to, and this is where I grew up. This is where my mom's family um, lived. Most of them lived there. In fact, behind my mother in this picture is um, the house that my mother's sister lived in, that my auntie lived in. So my cousins are there. And then two houses down the other way uh, lived my uncle, and then down on the other corner was another auntie. And so all of our family lived right in the same neighborhood, right next to each other. So we grew up very culturally intact. Um, and so uh, this is us with our mother. This is uh, with our father. These pictures are shot back in the 60s um, and uh, gives you a sense of who we are. But I grew up on an Apache reservation, although we didn't know that that's what it was at the time. During the 60s, um, my, mother, my father left when I was 12 years old and my mother became involved in the Chicano movement. Now she was already doing work in a tri-county area there in southeastern Colorado working with farm workers. And what she realized in working with farm workers was the, the, the degree of racism and oppression that the farm workers were experiencing just because they were brown, but they're experiencing these from the farmers. 
So my mother became very involved in the Chicano movement and as part of this involvement um, drug us along. So in this picture on the one on the bottom right, uh, I am holding a flag there, that's me and we're holding the Huelga flag. So we're supporting uh, all the movements, all the things that are happening and the, the boycott of lettuce, the boycott of grapes is one of them. We're protesting here out in front of the Safeway there in Lahana, Colorado. And so a lot of Chicano people were getting involved. Shortly thereafter, we ended up moving. Uh, so we started um, still there in the same community. We started an organization where I lived that was called the Las Animas Chicano Association. As you can see here, most of these people are youth. These are young people in high school primarily. Uh, I'm all the way on the far right. There was my fist in the air and the green uh, army jacket on. Uh, my mother's in there, my cousins are in there, all the, all the kids from the barrio. We organized ourselves in such a way that we had connections from Lamar, which is very south down and close to the Kansas border, all the way up into Manzanola. So the whole Arkansas Valley, young Chicano um, youth were uh, organizing themselves around the, the notion, the ideas of the Chicano movement. Now, typically when someone went from one of the small towns to another small town, they would get beat up. That's just what happened. That's the kind of rivalry that, that, there, that existed between towns. But we could move freely between all these towns because we were part of a movement. And we were involved with other young students that were also part of this movement. There were also adults involved, but the youth were, were, were sort of the, the glue of all of this. So that really uh, stirred us and moved us forward. And we did this work um, for several years, for about four years. Uh, I actually started when I was 13. So I guess about three years when I was 16, we ended up moving to Boulder, Colorado. My mother uh, realized that things weren't working well for her. They had made several uh, assassination attempts on my mother, uh, the farmers had when she was there. And so she decided she needed to get out of there and get the family out of there. So she moved us to Boulder, she applied to college and uh, we ended up in Boulder, Colorado. Here's a picture of myself and my siblings. I'm on the left um, at the Crusade for Justice because as soon as we got into Boulder, we got involved with uh, Corky Gonzalez at the Crusade for Justice um, in what was going on there, even though we're living in Boulder. And here's some pictures that I shot um, of one of the protests that we had. So the, the student protest in Boulder was involved in everything. They're involved in um, Cesar Chavez's uh, movement, farm worker movement. They're involved in Chicano movement in the Crusade for Justice. They're involved in the student movements. Uh, UMAS, the United Mexican American Students, was a Chicano organization on campus that did a lot and changed a lot, constantly taking over buildings and protesting and doing all this stuff. It was a it was a the best education anyone could have, could have asked for. Their um, motto was the idea of get an education and put it to work for your community. In other words, we're not going to school just to educate ourselves and get a good job. Our idea is to do something for our community. And they're saying lost to our land education is our stand. There was an understanding as Chicano people and as part of the Chicano uh, manifesto, if you will, that we, um, we have been displaced. We are an indigenous people and we have been displaced. And as a part of this displacement, we don't always know who we are. And so we've taken on these different names, these different monikers. But at this point, we're calling ourselves Chicana. We're declaring for ourselves who we are, that we are, are, are children of two things. One is the colonization that has happened uh, from the people up from Mexico City, uh, extending out to the Iberian Peninsula. And as a part of that, our, our mothers, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers were raped by them. So we are children of them. But at the same time, we're also indigenous people and we are a mix of this. Um, and I don't know that we could fully articulate or understand that at the time, but we're still resisting. In all the ways that we can, we're still resisting. So here are some of the people, at least in Colorado, that I like to call attention to. Uh, my mother on the left there, because she was uh, a prominent leader in the Chicano movement. Uh, in the center picture up on top, we have um, Ricardo Falcon and Priscilla Falcon holding the, the farm workers flag on a protest that we're doing. Hundreds of Chicanos would show up to center Colorado and we'd protest there uh, for a couple of days and, and, and do our work and support the farm workers. To the right there is Len Avila who's seated there on his knees um, and he's talking to the people there in center Colorado and him and, and Manny Martinez were the ones that were doing the work in center Colorado organizing the farm workers down there. So we hear a lot about Cesar Chavez, but we don't hear is the movement right here in Colorado, the boycott against lettuce and the work that Len Avila was doing. Of course, on the bottom here is uh, Corky Gonzalez on the left and uh, Jose Calderon who was doing work up in the Greeley area and doing a lot of good work up there. 
On the bottom right is a picture of myself and Judy shortly after we've been arrested. Uh, we've been arrested and, and charged with vandalism for spray painting a um, dumpster because we're organizing for the March 17th rally after Luis Junior Martinez had been killed at the Crusade for Justice. A year later, we're, we're, we're organizing that in, on March 17th in 1974. So here we are, I'm, I'm a part of this. There are a lot of people, and I have left on the left some names of some people who were part of the Movimiento. A lot of times women are left out, but um, there were some prominent women that were doing work. Shirley Otero has done a lot of work and helped to turn things around in Southern Colorado and claim back some of the land from the land grants that was taken uh, by Americans. Um, Taylor in particular was Taylor Mountain. So good people doing work and a lot of women doing work, but these are Apache people who will continue the struggle, who, who are, are no longer affiliated or recognized by the BIA tribes. So um, the, the Jicaria and the Mezcaleros and the Lipanes and uh, San Carlos and some of the others don't recognize us as their relatives, but it doesn't matter. We know who we are and, and we continue to do the work and continue to do the struggle. Um, and, and although we call ourselves Chicano or we call ourselves something else, um, and today a lot of people unfortunately are taking on terms that are really, really outside like Hispanic and Latino or Latinx, and they've really missed the whole notion of who we are as, as an indigenous people. The fact is we still are an indigenous people on our homeland here in Colorado deserving of recognition for that. Uh, some more pictures uh, in the upper left is um, again, uh, the students, uh, Chicano students here in Boulder marching. That's a picture that I shot down there. We have the bombing that happened in 1973 where Luis Junior Martinez was killed and a number of uh, Chicanos were beat up there at the Crusade for Justice. On the bottom left was the march that, 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 that sort of incited, the, incited this, this, this bombing from the police department. Um, what happened is uh, people had taken over at Wounded Knee. My auntie was there. Um, Conico uh, Minjares, and um, and so in the front here, I have a picture. You see a black beret from the Crusade for Justice there, walking with the Lakota people, and the Lakota people are leading the march. And behind them are thousands of Chicanos that are that are supporting uh, this takeover at uh, Wounded Knee. Now, in some ways, people would like to separate them and say, and say "Well, it's the American Indian movement, the Chicano movement," but it was never separate. Chicano movement has always been an indigenous movement. And um, while we're supporting what's happening at Wounded Knee, we're also at Wounded Knee. There are Chicanos in Wounded Knee uh, during the occupation. And there are Chicanos that were always a part of uh, the movement, the American Indian movement. So it's never been separate. When we began to recognize this and, 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 and move as an indigenous community, the FBI recognized the potential of this. And they realized there were more Chicanos than there were American Indians, at least people identifying that way. And as a consequence, that could be problematic. So that's why they, they, they did what they could to disrupt the, the, the movement and just, um, get some of our, our leaders killed. And they were very effective in what they did. Um, and so that's part of what was happening there. And that's why they bombed the Crusade for Justice. On the bottom right is a protest. Uh, once uh, Kiko Martinez, who was one of our people and accused of sending bombs in the mail, um, had to leave. And he ended up in Cuba. And he was there for a period of time. But when he returned, they caught him at the border, arrested him. Um, they acquitted him of all charges, but this is one of the protests that we have where people are marching in support of Kiko Martinez. Um, here's a picture of me uh, just before I'm headed off to um, uh, start life on my own, <clears throat> leave the family and, and start my life. I ended up in college um, in 1975, in the spring of 1975. Um, and so here's a picture of me there taken in, um, what we call the Cedars, which are south of uh, La Junta. I, I have to talk about myself as uh, someone who's been involved in the, uh, it was the gay, Amer uh, the gay movement, and that's what it was called. And over time, in, in, at this time, Amendment 2, they introduced the term queer and readopted that term. So now we say the queer movement. But I was also part of Boycott Colorado. When they passed Amendment 2, um, I was one of the, I was the figurehead, the speaker, even though there were a lot of other people, in particular some women that were doing the work to, to, to initiate this boycott. As a consequence, Colorado lost about $20 million because of this boycott. What we're trying to do is stop um, the, the oppression of the, amend, the passage of Amendment 2, and eventually we won it in the courts. Um, and, and from there, we actually went to the March on Washington, uh, one of the largest mar marches, over a million people from the gay and lesbian community, um, 
uh, went there. And you can see me in the black and white picture on the upper right. I'm uh, filming the event because I was working for Channel 12 and I'm filming this stuff and getting it and trying to to document all of this um, because people forget about these movements and these things that happen. And, and then the other pictures are, are the people that are marching from Colorado in this huge, massive protest in Washington, DC. Um, years later, um, I, I became involved at that point with the Two-Spirit community. We're at a gathering here in New Brunswick in this picture. Um, and this is uh, Beverly Little Thunder, one of the leaders of the uh, Two-Spirit community, one of the organizers of these Two-Spirit gatherings that started happening in 1987, and they continue to happen up until the present. Um, and, and in um, the mid-1990s, I began holding uh, gatherings here in west of uh, Boulder in the mountains. And people came from across Canada and the U.S. to be a part of it. The difference between our Two-Spirit Gathering and the International Two-Spirit Gathering was ours was specifically spiritually related. People came here to sit on the hill. It was a spiritual camp. And they came here to learn um, the ways that had been forgotten. And we forget that people were displaced with the Termination Act in the 1950s and moved into the cities. And they were in boarding schools in the Native communities. Uh, they were put in boarding schools for almost 100 years there. And because of that, they forgot their ways too. So when they became involved in the American Indian movement, thanks to uh, people like uh, Black Elk and um, uh, Crow Dog and some of the others, they found their way back onto a spiritual path. At the same time that Chicanos are learning from them, so are the American Indians learning from them, particularly the urbanized Indians. So this uh, camp that I was holding was to take people back and help them to learn uh, their pathways back. At the time, I'm running ceremonies uh, with permission uh, from my teachers. Uh, I'm running the Anipis and stuff. And I began attending other Two-Spirit gatherings in Montana, in Oklahoma, and different places, and trying to instill in them the need to, one, be more diverse, um, rather than just be all male gatherings, uh, Two-Spirit gatherings, that they, they needed to include women, but they also needed to include spirituality, that we can't be who we are without a spiritual movement. And I think that that's something that we learned in the Chicano movement, is that um, it's not enough of a movement. If it's just a movement of anger, the anger dissipates at some point, and then you're left with nothing, that you have to incorporate a level of spirituality. And we find that not as, not as Christians, but we find that as indigenous people in our, our rituals and our ceremonies. We were invited to open up for a huge uh, conference that was happening here in Denver. This happened uh, a month after my, uh, after my father died, so my hair's cut short here as we're doing this as we're uh, beginning this journey, but I'm organizing the community. Um, I started the National Two-Spirit Community, uh, the National Two-Spirit Society across the country and their chapters that are extending all over. Here's one of the marches that we went to in Denver. This is a gay pride, uh, but we have a community of people that have come from across the country to join us here. Uh, and eventually I'm invited to speak at the Millennium March on Washington in 2000. Um, bringing indigenous people from across the country. We got a permit, so we were able to put up a teepee. We set that up and we held a ceremony while we were there. And then we also opened up that march uh, by drumming uh, as people just are beginning initiating the march. So it was a lot of work. Um, I spent a good number of years with traditional healers uh, from different communities. Um, this is mostly Elena Avila here, uh, Elosochi, who are two of my teachers. So I studied with um, Lakota people. This is Be Beverly Little Thunder and I in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, with Muriel Ashmore, who's no longer with us. Lakota Oneida, who taught me how to put people on the hill, put them up for their what we call vision quest, Ablechaya or Teonetsa Walitsli. Ejecateo Coatlinchan, Mitlan Ejecateo Coatlinchan, Mexica Aztec from Mexico City, uh, who I, I learned from. I didn't apprentice with him, but I did study with him. Elena Avila, who I did apprentice with, uh, who's a curandera, and you can find her books if you go searching for them. Uh, El Sochit, who is my madrina, and the one that gave me the name Atecpatzin when I completed my studies in curanderismo. Um, I've also spent considerable time with uh, Robert Cross, who's Lakota, um, and I've danced with Raul Tlaloc Chavez, um, uh, who's a danzante of Grupo Huitzilopochtli. Um, and then uh, my tío Tomás, who's Apache, um, uh, Sierra Blanca Apache uh, and leads the Sundance in Southern Colorado in the Gardner area uh, every year. Um, Cindy never miss a shot, uh, Heoka from the uh, Chichagu Lakota people uh, asked me to carry her altar 
for a period of time because she didn't think she was going to live long enough to pass it down to her children. Um, so she had me carry her altar and I studied with her for four years. Um, and then uh, Sonora uh, was Chichimeca, uh, who's from uh, Amatlan, in Mexico, uh, with the Concheros, who's the one that taught me how to play the concha. And so these are some of my um, people that uh, my, the teachers that I, not all of them, but some of the teachers that I studied with from myriad different, from, from Mexico City, you know, all the way up into uh, South Dakota, people that I'm studying with in the different ceremonies that we're holding. Um, so uh, let me jump here to today in a little of uh, what we're doing. I've been talking for a long time, so I need to close it up. But um, let me say that, you know, today we have to think about the ceremonies that we're doing. When we think about the sweat lodge ceremonies, it's a place for us for prayer and it's a place of us where we strengthen our beliefs and it's one of the rituals we participate across communities. But at this time with this disease, one of the things we need to take into account is that if you go into the lodge and you're, you have steam coming off the rocks, that's an excellent, excellent vector for viruses and bacteria. And we don't take that into account. We think that Wakantanka um, or Omate or some or the other or, or, what, or whatever deity that we believe in is going to protect us from this. But you know what? The viruses don't care. A virus does not concern itself with our religious beliefs. And the virus is just looking for a host. And so these become vectors for, for, for transmission of diseases. And we've seen this over time in our community. We have a rule, if you're sick, if you've been sick, if you have a cold or a flu, please don't come to the ceremony. Don't come and spread your disease with other people. And so that's what we need to think about today as we lock ourselves in. Who are we? What have we endured? What have we had to put up with? We have many ceremonies that we go through that strengthen us and give us help. Um, and these, these, these are great ceremonies, but the fact of the matter is sometimes these ceremonies can be vectors for transmission of diseases. And that is not our intent in what we are doing. So um, I encourage all of you to stay safe, to be well. Remember that the work that we do as spiritual community, it's very simple, chop wood, carry water. We always have to, it's always about giving back and, and being respectful of the community that we're in, but also remembering who we are. Our intent as Apache people is to get ourselves recognized so that we have the permissions that we need um, to do, to continue to be Apache people in the ways that we want to, the ways that we need to, and the way we need to express ourselves. So I'm going to finish there um, and leave it up and, and let our uh, host uh, bring us back in. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's just such an incredible journey that you've had. And I'm so thankful that you are willing to share that today with the community. Um, and even more so the foundation for legislation that's in progress that we're working on to recognize the nine bands. Um, our history personally has overlapped uh, in many places. Um, growing up uh, as identifying as Apache my whole life with my grandfathers, um, it was such a blessing to meet you and to have heard of you from family. Uh, they gave me certain clues uh, certain genetic clues, certain gene genealogy, certain words, certain language. And it actually has been the language that I have found that um, connects me and the protocols that we all carry that we have in common. So I want to thank you for sharing that beautiful and rich history um, from the beginning, at least as far back as we can go on the maps. Um, it was beautiful. We want to open it up for questions, so I'm actually going to be unmuting the um, attendees um, in the in the group, and I'm going to also um, ask for us to feel free in, in oral tradition instead of chatting uh, to ask questions. So, who would like to go first? If you raise your hand or wave, I can can unmute your mi uh, microphone so that we can hear. I'm looking and I am unmuting. So, uh, David, David, I see David under there. I see a couple and waving. Want to introduce yourselves? Unmute your mic and introduce yourselves and ask any questions or comments. I'm, I'm trying to get to you, Zoe, and to get to Sky. Hello, Yvette. Welcome. Welcome, Yvette. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
with that theme, it's short theme. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to ask you, was there a point like here in Colorado or in the Southwest where the Eastern colonizers met with the Spaniards? Do you know what I mean? Like. Um, yeah, yes. So, so what happens is when we think about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, <clears throat> uh, one of the people that the people that 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 that's not always recognized, um, Shivington and and that that whole group of army that they trained right here in Boulder, Colorado, that that went down and killed everyone um, at the Sand Creek Massacre, were the same people that actually went down into New Mexico and claimed New Mexico for the United States. So the point at which they 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 are uh, fighting with they they simultaneously did two things they're they're simultaneously fighting against the Texans who are trying to claim New Mexico um, for the South to to include slavery uh, and they're and, and Colorado is a non-slave uh, state they're they're simultaneously fighting the Texans but they also are claiming that territory for the United States as opposed, and that's when they're, they're, they're also fighting against Mexico. So they're doing all this stuff simultaneously at the same time. Um, they're both uh, taking the territory from the Texans who wanna claim it, but they're also taking the territory from the Mexicans. So when we hear about the Alamo and all the things that happened there, New Mexico is, is one of the territories where the fighting actually is happening and, and it's, it's claimed here. There was not a lot of resistance from New Mexico when, when they actually went down there and, and claimed this area. Um, and there wasn't a lot of resistance when Shivington went down and fought the, uh, the Texans there in New Mexico. Um, so, so because we're trying to stay out of the way and, and we had the opportunities, Armijo was the, was the governor at the time and Armijo just wanted to stay out of the way. He took all the gold and he took off and headed south for Mexico. Um, he wasn't gonna get involved, so yeah. What dates would those have fallen around? Um, those would have been uh, the 1840s all the way into the 1860s. Does that coincide with any of the Pueblo Wars? Uh, no, the Pueblo War. So what had happened is there was a there was a Pueblo War that people don't talk about. There was a fight in New Mexico that happened in the 1830s. This is before the Americans have arrived. Um, Mexico has freed itself in 1821 from Spain, and when it freed itself from Spain, uh, it declared in the Plan de Iguala uh, in 1821 that uh, desde entonces ahorita todos somos ciudadanos mexicanos. In other words, what they're saying is from now on we're not going to use all these different. Um, racial uh, categories that were like close to, there's 20, there are over 25 racial categories that, the, that have been imposed by the colonizers from the Iberian Peninsula. And what they're saying is from now on, everybody is, we're all just Mexicanos. Well, that freedom included this area all the way up here into Colorado that was part of <clears throat> Mexico, right? And so when they free themselves from Spain, well then Mexico remembered that they had this, this territory up in the north, so they sent a governor. Armijo was the governor, but they sent someone from Mexico. When they sent this guy from Mexico, um, there was resistance because this guy was clueless, didn't know how things worked in New Mexico, which already had a culture of being there for several hundred years. Um, and so the people from the north, from Rio Arriba, resisted, including one of my great grandfathers. There were four men that organized the resistance. They organized 2,000 people to fight against this particular governor who only had 200 people. Of those 200 people, most of them were from Santo Domingo. They left and they left with him with about 35 people. Uh, they killed him, uh, that new governor, and then they reinstilled a new government in, uh, in Santa Fe. So that was part of a resistance that was happening there. There was an indigenous resistance because those Pueblos were responding to this imposition from Mexico City. Um, so there was a resistance. You, you don't hear about that one. And it was, a, it was a conflict that happened between Rio Arriba, the northern New Mexico, and Rio Abajo, which was Albuquerque in southern New Mexico. Um, in the end, southern New Mexico wins that uh, debate because the people who instilled themselves really didn't know what they were doing and they couldn't govern well. So they put Armijo back in as the governor. And then Armijo was the governor when all these other things transpired later on. Um, and what they did was my grandfather and the other three guys that they arrested is they had them in jail for about four or five months. And then they finally just um, hanged them and then caught out, cut off their heads. And so that's how they sort of put down that revolt, if you will. But that was indigenous people responding. But that wasn't to American colonization. The American colonization happened separately. Um, 
And so post-1848, uh, there are pockets of resistance. The, um, I think it's Jaramillo brothers that are down in, um, in uh, San Luis. There are the Gorras Blancas that are happening in New Mexico, cutting up the fences. So there was resistance, but it wasn't an organized resistance, I think, until about the Chicano movement. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. There are other questions? Uh, is everybody there? We had a little bit of a, a kind of stopped uh, for a moment. Is everyone still able to hear? I can hear. Yeah. Okay. We, I don't know if it was a technical difficulty or a, a Zoom thing, but um, we didn't get to hear, I didn't get to hear the last part of what you were saying, Uncle David. Would you be able to surmise maybe again? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So, um, it, and it may be because um, show, I think that you're not muted. And so it may be conflicting with it if there's noise in the background there. So when I'm talking, you, you want to make sure you're muted. I don't um, have a way to do that. I, there's no way I was looking for it, but the only way I can mute is to turn off my microphone through my computer. Oh, okay. That, well, that works. Um, because because we're getting yeah some feedback from that so so one of the things I was saying is um, I don't know how much you caught and what you missed out on but there there was some resistance in New Mexico and the resistance was uh, between the people who had settled it was a new colony called Santa Cruz de la Cañada which is um, sits right around uh, Pawake in that area and and uh, Armijo who actually came from Albuquerque. So once the people from uh, Santa Cruz de la Cañada and Taos and that area had organized and, and, and fought with the governor and dispatched the governor that was sent up from Mexico, um, then there was a conflict in terms of governance, who would govern New Mexico, and there was a conflict between the people in Albu Albuquerque and those from Santa Cruz de la Cañada. The people from Albuquerque won, and um, as I said, they, they, they hanged the four uh, organizers, which included one of my great-grandfathers, um, there in uh, from Santa Cruz de la Cañada, uh, his name was Esquivel, and they 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 hanged them and then they they uh, beheaded them uh, as a way to stop this uh, this her movement and this this sort of argument between the north and the south in New Mexico. You don't hear about this, and no one talks about these histories. Because these are some of the things that you know. Doing my family histories, I got to learn about who was doing what and how people res were resisting at the time. So yeah, did that help? Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions? Anyone else? I actually have a question. As we okay. go forward with as the color uh, Patches de Colorado is, um, what are some of? I know that we've talked about ceremonial reasons, um, but what are some of the other concerns that we have for our people um, as a detribalized population? Uh, what other things are are, should we be aware of as we're as we're working together to gather community? So, so ceremony is where we have found the most conflict with the white world that we're living in today. So, when we want to do our fires or we want to do our ceremonies or we want to do our drummings, that um, those are the ways in which the police show up to try to um, disrupt our ceremonies, and and that's that's where we see the conflict. But it's not the only conflict. If we think about the other thing that's, that's, um, that we have to take into consideration, in order for the United States, and I'm going to use that, the US government uh, and, and all of its people, all, all the white community that came here and invaded our, our native territory, in order for them to take our territory, they made agreements with us. They made agreements. And while we, my, my uh, grandparents may not have had their signature on the treaties, they were represented by people in our communities that were speaking on their behalf and signed those treaties on our behalf. So we don't have to be present at the meeting to be represented. I don't have to be in Washington, D.C. for my representative to make a decision about my life. And, and so we need to take that into account and, and quit uh, excusing the fact that sometimes our people weren't present when the treaties were signed, because a lot of times we didn't want those treaties signed. We, weren't, we didn't want to make the agreements. But some people in our, in our communities signed these treaties and made the agreements, but there was consistencies in the, in the agreements. The agreements were, we will be provided 
housing, we will be provided food, we will be provided shelter, we will be provided education and health care. These are part of the agreements. You're taking our land, and in exchange, this is what we get. Well, we as, as, as Apache people, we as uh, Henisaro people, we as indigenous people still living in Colorado, New Mexico, in this area, but in particular in Colorado, this has not been recognized. We are not allowed to sit at the boards, to sit on the councils, to have a voice. When, when I go to speak to, to, the, to the municipal governments or the state government, they write me off and ignore me because they don't have to recognize us because law doesn't dictate that they recognize us as indigenous people of this area. We need that recognition so that we have a voice at these boards, at these tables, and with these, these uh, political entities, municipal, county, and, um, and state uh, representatives and, and, and uh, political entities. So that's part of what this is also about. The other is we were promised health care and we were promised education. Now, granted, um, Indian health is not the best health care. You really don't want to go to Indian health. And I, I, I'll just be honest and trash it because what they do is they're bringing in Men, that aren't, men and women that aren't even doctors, mostly women that aren't even doctors yet, they're just fresh out of medical school, and then they go and they do an internship in the, in the native community for a couple of years and they get their, their, their loans written off, and then they move on. They don't really care about us. So these aren't practiced doctors that are working in our communities. It's not the best health care, but our health care should be paid for. And, and however we organize that, that means that we could go to any doctor that we want, get the best medicine we want, and it should be paid for. That's what we're looking for. What else are we looking for? Education. We, because this is our land and we were promised education, should be able to go all the way through school and get a PhD if that's what we want. And these things have been denied us. Why? Because they say, well, we're not Indian. We're not recognized by the BIA. That's just not the case. So that's what we're struggling for. What are we looking for here? We're looking for our rights, our very basic rights, not civil rights, the rights that were granted to us as indigenous people when this land was stolen from us. That's what we're looking for. And that's what we're looking to, to, to remedy uh, by getting state recognition. They may not appreciate this, but that's still, this, these were their agreements, their agreements when they came and took our land, so. Thank you for that. And I'm so thankful to hear your passion um, because a lot of times we get asked as an organization, why did we form? And the reason that we formed was going through seeing the environmental cancers in my family, losing my aunties, my, my grandmas, my, my grandpas, and my, my parents. You now my great grandfather lived to be, and I use that term just in American concept so that people can understand the timeline, but my great grandfathers lived to be 112, 115. My mother and my father didn't live until, they, were, they only lived until they were 56 and 58 um, from these environmental industrial cancers that were brought with the Rockefellers at CF&I and later the Dow Chemical Company with the burial of the um, ionizing radiation, all of those chemicals they were using for nuclear bombs over in Arvada. So um, we started this organization with the seven years of giving to our Lakota, Nakota, Dakota families, Shoshone Bannock families, Paiute families, um, the 200 and some tribes that are in represented in Denver um, with DIC and other organizations. And we began um, uh, in 2013 so that we could gather our people um, to bring awareness and health. And now we'll be offering the telehealth um, as one of our enrollment, um, uh, enrollment opportunities. And then also um, gonna introduce Amber Lane here who's, who's got a question um, or a statement. Um, and Amber is actually helping us put together a listing of Apache medical doctors, nurses, CNAs, um, and other indigenous care providers so that we do have access to our own people. Um, and then working on the legislation to make sure those inherent rights are maintained and respected. Um, many of us have been here since before 50 AD. My family has been on both sides of White Mountain um, in the Apishapa Valley and what is now called San Luis. Uh, so I am invested and related to many of you um, by blood in some way in some part of our history. Uh, so you're my family. It's my inherent right to be able to practice and to care for you. So I wanted to give you a little bit about why we're also interested in supporting um, legislation and working in the medical field uh, to find our people. Uh, Amber, are you, are you there and are you ready? I'm unmuting you. 
Yeah, I'm here. Go can ahead. you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Go ahead with your question or statement. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing so much. Um, I had a question about, I'm, I'm living in Fort Collins where they have the council tree, um, which was a gathering spot for natives. And I'm wondering how, when you were mentioning like um, World War One, I, I know the Haudenosaunee fought on both sides um, the, um, at that time. And then that two dogs actually had a copy of the Great Law of Peace on a buffalo hide when I was up at Standing Rock. Um, and the, Haudenosaunee aren't under the BIA um, and they have, there was 80 other tribal nations that fell under the protection of the great law at one point, but the Haudenosaunee don't know who those different nations are or that those different people are. And so I was wondering if you had any information about the council tree and that gathering space or the great law of peace and, you know, the timeframes and how that kind of comes together and might be able to be a way for everybody to move forward as well. But you, you know, I, unfortunately, I don't. I, I've done in, uh, uh, an incredible amount of history uh, on Apacheria and Tehuayo in, in our relationship to uh, the, the Eastly, which we call the, the, the umbligo, the, um, the belly button of, of, our, of our, 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 our center, if you will, which is in Tenochtitlan, which is Mexico City. So I have a vast history of that. Uh, east of the Mississippi, I don't know a whole lot. Now, uh, the Apache people extended all the way out to there. There was actually a community up in Kansas uh, referred to now as Cuartelejo. And if you've ever been there, a beautiful area, you would understand why our ancestors settled in that area and tried to escape what was happening here with the colonizers from the south. Um, but what was happening with the French Indian War was really, it, 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 was, it really was... Um, a, a, a war between the English speakers, the English speakers, the, and the French speakers who were trying to claim territory and pulling our communities into that. And our communities were just trying to survive uh, up in that area. And so they're just trying to choose a side and, and, and obtain guns and whatever. And some of them, as, as always the case, just wanted to get away. So that's why we have the Lakota people, the the, the Sioux people, the, uh, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, they're just trying to get away. This is all happening in the 15, 1750s. That's the time frame when this is all happening. Um, but, but, but all I can speak to is, is the arrival of the people as a consequence of that first okay. world war. Oh, one, two, three. Well, thank you for that. And that's, that was one of the questions that Amber had um, actually asked me. Uh, and we've discussed before, and I wasn't sure, you know, as Apaches, the way that we were raised was that we were very independent, um, not chiefs, but captains. Um, people stepped up into those roles because they had the ethical weight um, and the patience to be able to work with other people um, as they were coming in and as we were, as we were convening and conferring uh, with each other. Uh, learning from each other what was coming from the east and then also sharing what had happened to us from the south. Um, so Amber, uh, thank you for asking the question. Hopefully we'll be able to continue to ask that question until we can find the answer because as uh, Uncle David and I also have conversations, you know, it's the questions really um, that help us find answers in our research, whether it's person-to-person uh, -person research, historical research, or going back through actual military documents and things that's on the other side and then finding our people and asking questions. So thank you for that. Um, it's yeah, 1121. Oh, I'm sorry, Amber? Yeah, I just had a kind of uh, follow-up kind of question too. Okay, great. Um, the Haudenosaunee in the United States, I was thinking, you know, is when you're talking about legislation and trying to get recognition. In 1987, the, um, the Haudenosaunee were recognized as the founders of real democracy. Um, and treaties Trump, you know, Trump at this point. Um, and I was wondering if there's any way, you know, kind of, you know, just a question to consider to be able to find, you know, those nations or those people that fell under that protection of that great law and use that as leverage because they're, the Haudenosaunee aren't under the BIA. Um, and so if you could explain like the difference too between, you know, BIA, state, federal, a little bit, just so I understand it a little more. 
Okay, um, so, so very briefly, um, I think that there are, uh, we, we're well aware of, of the communities that have made treaties with the colonizers as they came across. And we have to, in this case, we have to speak about um, the, the English speaking colonizers, the, the US, if you will, as it's uh, extending itself. They are making treaties and the people that made treaties can fall back on those treaties and say, this is the law and, and because it's the law, then this is what we can exercise in the law. But there are those communities like many of the Apache peoples, because we're bands and we're extended all over the place. If, if one band makes a treaty, um, the other bands may not know about it and it affects them, but it doesn't mean they know the details of it. It affects them in that um, when something is imposed upon Apache people, it's imposed upon all Apache people. But if, if uh, a privilege is being extended, it's only gonna be extended to that band. And that's what happened is the people that signed the treaty got the privileges, if there were any, the people that weren't there, sorry, you weren't there. But that's, you know, that, that's, a, that's not taking into account how Apache people have traditionally govern themselves, if you will, if we want to use that term governed. We don't, we don't think of ourselves as governing ourselves. We are very independent people. And, and if we get state recognition, we're going to extend our form of governance and not an imposed uh, form of governance on us. Um, our community doesn't have any right uh, imposing upon communities spread out through Colorado about how they need to govern themselves. And a band can be a very small family band. It could be a larger band. But when we come together, we do things collectively, as has always been our traditional way of doing things, but we don't tell each other what to do. That's just not our way of doing it. So setting up this idea of a chief or a, a president or a, chief or a chairman, I mean, that's, that's not how we govern ourselves. And, and, I, and that's not what we're trying to impose. What we're trying to do is recognize that, that we have many different bands, many different communities in Colorado that are all Apache that need to be recognized so that we get the privileges that were promised us but it's up to us to determine how we're going to extend those privileges. And it's not going to be by an outsider standard. They'd like to impose that. And we're saying, no, we'll decide how we're gonna govern ourselves. And we'll, meet, we'll send our representatives to you and tell you um, what we need from you. Um, again, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not what they want. And, and this is my perspective of it. Maybe other people in other, in other bands would say it differently, but I think that our autonomy is really important. And, and that's one of the things that we want to respect if we get state recognition. And if the state recognizes us, then the state will deal with us with that level of nation to nation uh, relationship. And so will the municipalities. The federal government won't, but the state will. If we get federal recognition, then the federal government also has to deal with us in the same way. But let me add one more caveat. Just because a, an indigenous community regards itself as a sovereign nation, it's not. There is not an indigenous community in this country that has their own territory that actually owns the land. The US government still continues to own the lands. They hold it in trust. So you can't even make decisions about opening up a business or doing anything on your own land because it has to be cleared through the federal government. I'm sorry, that's not sovereignty. That's not sovereignty. And so we need to rethink this. And so as Apache people, we have the opportunity to do that. We're free to rethink our relationship and what that relationship will look like. But when we, but the first place is to get state recognition and get them to recognize that they need to deal with us on our own terms rather than on their terms. So that's, that's what we're looking at, at least from my perspective and from our community's perspective. Hello, can I say a few words? Yes, absolutely. Um, my name is Vivian Delgado. For those of you who don't know me, I'm zooming in from Bemidji, Minnesota. I'm a professor of indigenous studies I do teach treaties, and so I wanted to make a few comments about the treaty questions. Um, actually, for the people who are traditionally or uh, aboriginally from Colorado, the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo could be applied um, to our benefit if need be. I don't, I, don't, I don't think we've ever really had that conversation among ourselves. I am, my mother is Tiwa Tewa, my father is, is Plaskoyaki, and so, and I'm from Colorado, even though I work in Minnesota. Um, but there are two sovereign nations in the United States. One of them is Red Lake Nation, and it's close to where I live. And the other one is Warm Springs, and they consider themselves sovereign because they have aboriginal title to their entire reservation. 
meaning that it's not checkerboarded. Uh, there are no white businesses on those reservations. They do close their borders. Um, and at one time, I think in the 70s, you needed a passport to go to cross through Red Lake. Um, but getting back to what David said, yes, but Congress still has plenary power over those tribes, meaning that with the stroke of the pen, they could very well change those, uh, those land, the land uh, claim with both of those tribes. And that's because they're federally recognized. I did have a conversation with another gentleman who was from Standing, or Standing Rock or Cheyenne River, one of them. And he was talking about how um, because of the Congress having plenary power over all of the federally recognized tribes and the trust relationship, meaning that you don't pay taxes. He said, but if tribes opted to pay taxes on their land, then Congress would not have plenary power any longer. They wouldn't have the stroke of the pen to take X amount of acres away from a nation like they do now. So, and I think that um, we're fortunate in Colorado because we're still looking at our status and our recognition because we can learn from everybody else's mistakes. I mean, these tribes have walked a slippery slope and they have paid millions of dollars, you know, to be where they're at. Not that we would do that, but um, just to know the extent of really what goes in there. And I think for now, um, you are sovereign as an individual. And treaties are written in a way that if you don't use it, you lose it. And so I think all of the tools that we have available to us that we need to use those. But like David said, it has to be collective. We can't go out individually and, and do our own soapbox thing. So. Yeah. Glad to be here this morning. Um, this is a wonderful conversation. I teach this 24 seven, so it's really nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Yes, thank you, Vivian. Very important points. Um, that's one of the things that we do discuss in our nonprofit is recognizing tribally enrolled citizenship um, to protect sovereign rights. I'm calling people, you know, just a, a relative, but when we have someone like Ernest Jr. Uh, speak, acknowledging Nuchu or the Ute um, by our own names, not, not acknowledging the Iroquois by that name, but by the Haudenosaunee. So I agree, I think the more that we work together to look at um, where have things gone wrong, where have things gone right, that we need to um, work together to make, to make that state recognition solid and Wrong. So thank you for the. Um, it's 11:30, so I'm going to ask Uncle David to give us prayer as we journey on our ways throughout the day and throughout the week. And um, again, uh, thank you so much, Hedna. Thank you. Thank you for bringing language and food and history and culture and the support that our people um, who were first into detribalization, who were. Uh, had our records burned in the Library of Congress fire before 1905, whose grandparents didn't have birth certificates or links even to Catholicism unless they were stolen um, uh, as being written in a book somewhere. Uh, I know that a lot of people really struggle with that, and so I'm hoping that this webinar today will give people a background and an understanding of how and where we have come from and how we have never left and how we are planning on moving forward together as, as a community. And as a representative of the Carlonis fam from the Apishapa Valley, I'd like to say that we do endorse both uh, David Young's remarks and his work, um, and that we are very appreciative to be recognized by each other um, in ways that the government would never understand. So thank uh -huh. you and Uncle David. So, grandfathers, grandmothers, we ask you to look down upon all of us that have been here today and gathered here today to hear these words. I, I'm appreciative of this opportunity to share a little bit of knowledge that I have. Um, I'm appreciative of the, the, the enthusiasm and the energy that lives within all of us here and, and, and our drive and desire to, to move our community forward in a way that will benefit uh, the generations to come. We do our work in our generation, but we know that what we do uh, 
ripples down into into the future and into the generations to come and so we are grateful for that and and we pray that you continue to watch over us and provide us as grandfathers and grandmothers the strengths that we need to be able to accomplish the things we've come to do as individuals as a community uh, and as people and, and in relationship to all people and all things to the plants to the animals to the sky to the planets to the stars we we are part of a larger larger circle and, and we recognize that and we're appreciative of that and we pray that in relationship to our, our mother earth that we're able to help her heal from the the injustices and the wounds that we've caused to her and that we're able to to, to rein ourselves in in such a way that we have better relationships with her uh with each other and uh, that we're able to stand our ground as we as who we are as apache people we are as indigenous people and and just step forward and walk forward and do what we need to do and we pray that you bless us so that those doors open up and those opportunities for us to be able to get that recognition that state recognition that we need and to be able to strengthen ourselves as a community we ask all of this in a good way grandfathers and grandmothers spirits of the four directions from um our father son and our mother earth Oh, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of their day and their week, the Cinco de Mayo, um, and send you each blessings to your family and all relatives in four directions for good health and strength and resilience. Um, our organization does offer complimentary services to enrolled tribal members and indigenous members. So if you do have a family member or a community member in need of uh, soup mix, the dried soup mix, um, seeds to garden, please do it. And we have our youth council um, forming a, a video conferencing and so telephone contacts to elders to do check ins to help me stretch out um, my time a little bit more effectively. So I want to thank you each again. It is a humbling experience to listen to you and to learn. Um, I always feel like I'm right there with my elders again um, and, and connected to the beauty and the vibrancy of our people. So thank you. Uh, join us and we'll be looking at our book, um, Herbal Gardens on this event line. We do have two community talks that are going on on the weekends, uh, Saturday at 11 a.m. do a general community talking circle just to discuss going through with impacts with COVID-19, identify needs, identify resources, and just generally explain how we're all doing. And then uh, Sky Yarbrough, um, Sky, would you give just a, a brief little intro about the Indigenous, with, Indigenous and Native Elders with Disability Circle? Could you give us a little, little talk? Are you there? There you are. <laughs> Good afternoon, or almost afternoon, everyone. It's an afternoon for me because I've been up since 4.30. So, <laughs> typical artists. Okay, so, um, intro. Well, uh, a few um, elders with disabilities have come together and started having the conversation and welcoming. Uh, it's a very inclusive conversation about what's going on. Uh, in the demographic and constituency of people's uh, native indigenous peoples with disabilities and elders. And so we get to hear stories of what's going on in Indian country and um, start the conversations about uh, how do we get those resources and come up with solutions. Right now, uh, we're doing the icebreakers. There's uh, this coming Sunday will be part three. And so, uh, uh, prayers are given by William Thompson and it's moderated by Ed Salvador. Uh, uh, and I facilitate. So I just do all the background stuff and try to stay out of the conversation because this is very local. Uh, what's unique about this is that it's getting Denver folks talking and uh, that is so needed right now. So this is also a part of healing. So everyone's welcome to, to join. Uh, it does not matter if you're able-bodied uh, or disabled. Uh, at this time of the junction, it's important that we bring 
all minds together and do our best to think as clearly as possible. Thank you, Nancy Ray, for letting me have a moment in the spotlight. You're welcome. And uh, I just want to say that we are interested in hosting a variety of panelists who would like to talk about things from their perspective. This is part of the Chinook Fund organization's uh, funding for us. We were granted a $10,000 grant for our voices and the legislation um, that we're bringing forward to work with our elders and uh, for resources. So we do want to hear from other community members. We enjoy uh, listening into just cultural perspectives. You know, we, we each grow each time we share um, and we each expand that uh, connectivity and make it stronger between us when we listen. So again, I just want to say from Herbal Gardens Wellness today, thank you to uncle and author David Young. You're going to have to tune back in to hear about his book. Um, uh, uncle David, did you want to give us an update on the book before we say goodbye? Um, so the book is on curanderismo, but it's also historical and it's also part of a, uh, an idea of resistance. You can't have healing without resisting the things that make you sick and part of what makes us sick is colonization. So we have to speak about that uh, in the process of uh, trying to get it published and hope we, I'm looking at a date of about July. If we can get it out in July, that would be great. And so it'll be available to people. It's called um, A Magic Feather. Well, thank you for that. And we'll look forward to before July or maybe right after publishing, um, having you speak more on the curanderismo, curanderismo. Sorry, I have aphasia from epilepsy, so I can't pronounce things right all the time. But um, we would like to have you back and host you again. So again, we want to say thank you and, and blessings to you each on your day. Have a good one. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you.